In today's lecture, we are leaving the bacterial kingdom behind. We are switching gears and moving into the eukaryotic world of pathogenic yeasts and fungi. When you hear the word fungi, you might be thinking mushrooms from the store. And while chanterelles and morels may be within the same kingdom and distantly related to some of our fungal pathogens, that's not exactly what we're going to be talking about in the next few lectures. It's estimated that we have approximately one and a half million species of fungi, um, although very few of them are encountered as pathogens. And that's a really good thing because fungi, just like us, are eukaryotic organisms. They're much more physiologically similar to mammals than bacteria are, which makes drug targets a really big challenge. We commonly think of pathogenic fungi occurring in two forms, either molds or yeasts, but some of the pathogens that we encounter aren't one or the other. I'd just like to direct your attention to this website from the University of Adelaide in Australia, uh, Mycology Online. They have a lot of really fantastic information there, a good resource where I've drawn some materials for this lecture series. Generally speaking, we can think of our fungi as being nucleated. So remember, they are eukaryotes. They possess a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. They have fungal hyphae with cell walls composed of chitin. This differentiates them from bacteria where we have a peptidoglycan composed cell wall. They have cell membranes, which contain ergosterol as the primary sterol, as opposed to cholesterol, which we see in animals. And we commonly visualize these organisms using some pretty basic techniques. We can do a KOH wet prep, so we use potassium hydroxide to break down all of the host tissues and leave behind the fungal elements. We can do very simple transparency tape preparations, and we can stain these organisms using India ink or methylene blue. Molds versus yeasts. Uh, these are actually purely morphological terms and do not necessarily have any taxonomic significance. So examples where we don't have taxonomic significance are our dimorphic fungi. These are organisms which at elevated temperatures, so kind of body temperature and above 35 degrees Celsius, grows as a yeast. And at cooler temperatures, they grow as a mold. So in these images here, you can see Blastomyces dermatididis. Um, we have a pure culture of the mycelial phase or the mold phase on the bottom here. And you can see microscopically, we have the hyphae and the little uh, blastospores. And then on the right, we have a yeast phase colony. So very, very different looking, just grown at a higher temperature and above a pure culture with the yeast organisms. In this image here, you can see the yeast forms growing within the body. Remember, we have higher temperatures. So when we get infections with these organisms, this is the uh, life stage that they convert to. Fungi are aerobic and most of them grow at lower temperatures. So between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius. They're tolerant of high pressures and low pH. So they're very, very resilient. They're capable of growing in a wide variety of environmental conditions. They play a very important role in the carbon cycle and nutrient cycling, and they have amazing abilities to degrade um, all sorts of polymers that other organisms aren't able to handle. So biopolymers, like things we find in wood, things like lignin, and also synthetic polymers made by people. In fact, we are increasingly looking at uh, fungi for their ability to degrade plastics. Recently, there's been a lot of attention paid to the ability of fungi for degrading polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, so essentially oil byproducts. Um, and there have been some really promising results that um, demonstrate the ability of these organisms to degrade all sorts of chemicals, including those which can otherwise be quite damaging in the environment. So fungi also make a lot of really delicious things. A lot of the fermented foods that we eat involve various fungal cultures. So whether it's one of the penicillium species in Roquefort or Brie cheese, or Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, producing either alcohol or used in the um, um, leavening of bread, uh, fungi are all around us. 
beyond delicious things, they also make very useful things. So penicillin is famously made by a penicillium species uh, fungi. And in these images here, you can see some of that penicillium growing on an agar plate. And here what we have is uh, penicillium inhibiting the growth of Micrococcus luteus, demonstrating the production of antibacterial substances. I put a link to a brief video above where you can see penicillin bursting open bacterial cells. Beyond all of these useful and delicious things, fungi are just really cool looking. Despite being a bacteriologist, I have to admit that they are just much more exciting to look at under the microscope. If anyone ever has the chance, I would encourage you to visit Micropia, which is a microbiology museum in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, the museum is composed of living exhibits, so they actually have a lab where they're preparing new demonstrations on a daily basis. And one of the demonstrations that I was really excited to see uh, was this slime mold. So slime molds aren't actually a fungus. Um, but they do some really amazing things. And I've put a link to a video above where you can see the uh, nutrient-seeking behavior of this slime mold and some kind of mind-blowing uh, observations that have been made on the Petri dish. So when do we see disease associated with fungi? So they obviously do lots of good things, but we're concerned with them in this class because sometimes they do bad things as well. So the pathogenesis of fungal-related diseases can either involve tissue invasion, so a mycosis, um, which might be really what you think of when you think of an infection. So on the left here, we have guttural pouch mycosis in a horse. They have this very unusual anatomic structure in the head and neck that's thought to be useful for cooling blood going to the brain, and it's a common site of fungal and, and also bacterial infections. And then on the right, we have ulcerative abomasitis caused by mucormycosis, so this fuzzy mold uh, growing on uh, the abomasum of this animal. We can also see disease associated with toxin production. So this is what we would call mycotoxicosis, and there's a variety of examples that are really well recognized. Uh, aflatoxicosis due to the production of aflatoxins um, in, in feed can affect poultry. We can see fusariotoxicosis. Um, Zeralinone is one example that's non-toxic for poultry but causes disease in pigs. And then ergotism. Um, ergot is a fungus that produces alkaloids um, when growing in on cereal crops. So just down below here, we have some moldy corn with fusarium species. And then on the right, we have some lesions associated with uh, fusariotoxicosis. So this severe hemorrhagic uh, leukoencephalomalacia with cavitation and sort of these hitting lesions in the brain. So the fungus itself doesn't have to be in the body in order to get sick and have pathology associated with these uh, organisms. And then finally, we can also see hypersensitivity reactions. So mold growing in damp buildings or moldy feed fed to animals is able to exacerbate asthma or heaves in horses. Um, this is really well recognized in people, and this is just an infographic from the CDC of uh, describing the personal protective equipment that's required when entering a moldy building. You can imagine this is really important following extreme weather events, so hurricane damage and flooding. You want to make sure to wear an N95 respirator, goggles, long sleeve shirt, gloves, long pants, um, and waterproof boots. So obviously our veterinary species probably aren't going in moldy buildings like we would be, but moldy feed products can pose a, a serious threat to the health of some of our animals. Taxonomy of fungi is in a little bit of a state of flux. Um, classically, it was heavily reliant on morphology. Do we have septate hyphae? What do the spores look like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, highly specialized skill set in order to be able to accurately identify these organisms. Increasingly, we're relying on DNA sequencing and Malditoff. So fungal taxonomy has really entered the molecular age. There's a little bit of uh, terminology that's important to understand taxonomy. So hyphae being maybe one of the most important ones. Uh, these are the filaments which make up the mycelium. 
Um, the mycelium being a mat of branching hyphae. So this is sort of what you think of when you think of a mold, that fuzzy, uh, fluffy kind of structure. Molds then also produce asexual spores, which disseminate to other locations and germinate when the conditions are favorable. These spores develop in or on a variety of different structures. So phyalloconidia, sporangia spores, macroconidia, microconidia, arthrospores, chlamydia spores, and blastospores, all really important um, to describing the different fungi of importance to human and veterinary medicine. Mm -hmm.